And it's my great pleasure to introduce now to you Professor Natasha de Groot. She comes from the Erasmus University in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and she will address an important question, atrial fibrillation and hypertension, a predestined match. <laughs> Atrial fibrillation has for the first time already been described in 1815. In 1904, it was recognized that atrial fibrillation is a specific arrhythmia. And then in 1906, the first surface electrocardiogram of atrial fibrillation was reported. Atrial fibrillation is regarded as the cardiovascular epidemic of the 21st century. It has been estimated that around 2015, nearly 6 million people in the United States will have atrial fibrillation. And if you have reached an age of 80 years or older, nearly 50% of the patients will have atrial fibrillation. If we take a look at the worldwide population, at this moment 0.5% of the population has atrial fibrillation. That's about 37 million cases. And that's only the patients who are, are, are symptomatic. And we don't have any clue about the patients who are asymptomatic. Atrial fibrillation is regarded as the final common pathway of both cardiac diseases, but also non-cardiac diseases. This table is derived from the guidelines of the ESC. And here we can see the risk factors for atrial fibrillation. And there are a variety of risk factors, both associated with the cardiac diseases, but also with non-cardiac diseases like pulmonary diseases or renal diseases. But then it also says hypertension is a risk factor and also borderline hypertension. And it's the most significant risk factor for atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation can potentially be curatively treated by a so-called pulmonary vein isolation. And this therapy is based on the discovery of Michel Hasegger around the 90s, where they saw that episodes of atrial fibrillation could be triggered by, the, by tissue within the pulmonary veins. And we nowadays treat atrial fibrillation by isolating the pulmonary veins, so isolating the triggers. But that's often not enough. And there's now an upcoming concept of the integrated AF management, in which we also manage the cardiovascular risk factors, such as hypertension. And we know that if we do the management most optimal, it will also improve the outcome of ablative therapy. But what is the relation between hypertension and atrial fibrillation? First, we can take a look at the epidemiological studies. And here we see a table derived from a survey performed in nine countries in Europe, where we can see that hypertension is the most common comorbidity in the patients with a variety of atrial fibrillation, so the variable types ranging from paroxysmal to persistent and also long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. In another study performed in Norway, where they had a follow-up of over 2,000 healthy men, they compared the baseline systolic and diastolic blood pressure with a long-term outcome. And in this study, they demonstrated that not only hypertension, but also blood pressure values within the range of the upper normal blood pressures is a long-term predictor of incident atrial fibrillation in healthy middle-aged men who were initially without atrial fibrillation. And here we see another study where they demonstrated that if there is an optimal blood pressure control, it might even decrease the burden of atrial fibrillation in hypertensive patients. So if we summarize all these studies, we can see that hypertension is an independent risk factor for incident atrial fibrillation, progression of atrial fibrillation, AF-related stroke, and AF-related mortality. But why is that? Well, first have to take a look into the mechanisms of atrial fibrillation. Here we see the surface EKG of atrial fibrillation, and we all know that the surface EKG of atrial fibrillation is is, can be identified by B2B B change in the P-wave morphology and also in the irregular RR intervals. And this is what you see when you record potentials direct, directly from the surface of the heart. So you see a continuous electrical activation and very chaotic. 
But this is what you have on the outpatient clinic. You have your individual patient with hypertension and atrial fibrillation. And atrial fibrillation in these patients is quite variable. They vary in the duration, the number of AF episodes, their triggers, the way they terminate. And on top of that, it also changes over time. We know that atrial fibrillation initially starts as a trigger-driven arrhythmia, but over time, when it transitions from the paroxysmal to the more permanent types of atrial fibrillation, it is more, becomes more a substrate-driven arrhythmia. And here you can see what happens. When you measure, for example, during cardiac surgery, when you make an incision in the atria, and you put two electrodes on the inner and outer layer of the heart, and your record electrical activity, you would expect that in a thin-walled atrium of only two millimeter, that there is one large wavefront during sinus rhythm propagating through the atria. And that is what we see here. You see uh, in color-coded uh, patterns of activation. You can follow the colors of the rainbow. You see the arrow. And if you just take a piece of atrial tissue, you see the smooth propagation. And when you record potentials from both the endo and the AP carnament, it looks the same. And this is during sinus rhythm. But this is obtained from a patient with proximal atrial fibrillation who had as a risk factor atrial fibrillation. And what we see here is that you can again see the patterns of activation in the colors, and you only have to take a look at the colors, and you see that the color maps on both the endo and the apicardium are roughly the same. And also the signals recorded from the AP and the endocardium, which you see on the right part of the slide, they are roughly the same. But if atrial fibrillation becomes more complex, and that is what you see in this slide, so here you see activation maps and signals obtained from a patient with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, you can already see by just comparing the colors that the colors are different. So the inner and the outer layer of the heart are not simultaneously activated, and that makes atrial fibrillation very complex. And when you take a look at the signals derived from the endo and the apicardia, you see also that they are quite different. So the endo and the apicardium during long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation become electrically dissociated. And that is important, because if you have a patient in front of you, at your patient clinic who has hypertension, untreated hypertension, and has already progressed from paroxysmal to the long-standing persistent types of atrial fibrillation, it means that every minute 8,000 waves are propagating from one layer to the other. And that is a novel mechanism from AF that has recently been discovered, but it is very important because it indicates that when atrial fibrillation becomes too complex, you can also not treat it very well. And what is then the me mechanistic interplay between atrial fibrillation and hypertension? We know that triggers and the substrates both play an important role in the development of atrial fibrillation. But how does hypertension influence those two factors? First, you have the triggers. It is known, if you take a look at the literature, that a higher incidence of supraventricular ectopy is related to the development of atrial fibrillation. Supraventricular ectopy occurs frequently in patients with hypertension and left ventricular hypertrophy. And if you put these patients on an exercise test, you can see that during the recovery phase, there might be an increase in the supraventricular ectopy. And it, there has been a study where they followed patients after exercise testing for over 40 months, and they showed that the higher incidence of supraventricular ectopy during the recovery phase of the exercise testing was associated with the development of atrial fibrillation during long-term follow-up. But what is exactly the mechanism interplay between those two phenomena? And this is what is summarized on this slide. So in the end, you have the atrial arrhythmias, that's atrial fibrillation, and you see that hypertension is associated with atrial fibrillation via various pathways. So hypertension influences sympathetic activity, and the sympathetic activity influences your dispersion of your acti electrical activity, which contributes to more complex patterns of activation. You may have inflammation, and inflammation influences the structure of the myocardium. And then you have left 
atrial stress, you're, when you have left atrial dilatation, they all promote uh, the development of fibrosis. Fibrosis induces structural remodeling. Structural remodeling gives rise to electrical remodeling, and that provides the substrate for the development of atrial fibrillation. And then on top of that, you also have a lot of genetic factors influencing the development of atrial fibrillation. At the end of my presentation, I would like to provide you with some food for thoughts. When you take a look at the pathophysiology of atrial fibrillation and hypertension, it is usually said that hypertension induces fibrosis, fibrotic tissue in the atria induces conduction abnormalities, the conduction abnormalities contain the substrate for atrial fibrillation, and with the, the growth of the substrate, you develop atrial fibrillation. But that's actually not completely the case. Fibrosis is not the only factor related to structural remodeling. There are many factors which relate to the structural remodeling, like for example, the protein proteostasis is an important factor in the development of atrial fibrillation. Fibrosis is not related to conduction abnormalities. Conduction abnormalities may also be caused by other abnormalities or even physiological uh, properties of the atrial tissue. And not all conduction abnormalities give rise to atrial fibrillation. So the relation fibrosis caused by hypertension leads to conduction abnormalities and then atrial fibrillation, I think, is much more complex. Then here are the take-home messages. So atrial fibrillation is the most frequent arrhythmia in hypertension patients. Hypertension is the most prevalent comorbidity in patients with atrial fibrillation. Hypertension induces atrial fibrillation by influencing the degree of atrial ectopy. And it also affects the atrial substrate. But how exactly is not yet known. Regulation of the blood pressure reduces the burden of atrial fibrillation. And regulation of blood pressure also improves ablation outcome. But again, the mechanism how hypertension results in the development of atrial fibrillation is still unknown. I would like to thank you for your attention. Well, Natasha, phenomenal lecture, as always. Very didactic and emphasizing a lot of important issues in the disease of atrial fibrillation. It's not just a simple disease, what we learned from your uh, presentation. I got several questions for you. Yeah. So the first one... Does hypertension, as you hinted, and I discussed a little bit about, does hypertension affect the success of AFib ablation in your practice? How do you deal with it? Uh, yes, I do think that uh, the presence of hypertension affects the ablation outcomes. If you have a recurrence after uh, pulmonary vein isolation, it can be simply because you have a gap in the lesion, and that's why you develop a recurrent AF. But we often see that when patients come in for a redo procedure, the pulmonary veins are isolated. Right. So that means that atrial fibrillation has already progressed to the substrate mediate arrhythmia. Um, and then you don't know exactly where the substrate is. So if you have hypertension for a very long time, the degree of structural remodeling is likely to be higher, and that might explain that you have more recurrences if you have an advanced stage of hypertension. So yes, I think it does influence the outcome of your ablation procedure. So when we see hypertension in whatever patient, we have to treat aggressively, You have right? to treat it aggressively, yes. Because uh, what percentage do you think of the patients with hypertension eventually develop atrial fibrillation? Just a guess. Well, if you just take a look at, at the worldwide literature, uh, if it comes to outcome of uh, uh, pulmonary vein isolations, and that's usually they don't have any other comorbidities, but mainly it's, it's hypertension. Mm -hmm. um, then you, if you have paroxysmal AF, true paroxysmal AF episode, it might be around 80%. But if you already have more persistent AF episodes, you require cardioversion, then you go already down to 60 to even 50%, and perhaps even lower if you have, for example, long-standing AF. So that's a very important issue what we're discussing here. Yes. You need to treat early. Yeah. You cannot wait too long. Yeah. Okay, another question that I have coming in is a little bit linked to that. So longer existing AF, is it still worthwhile to ablate? Um, what are the results in longer existing 
AF, but give us some of your insights and, and tell us when we should refer maybe. Um, yeah, the paroxysmal AF, the therapy is clear. You need to, to isolate the pulmonary veins. When it comes to uh, persistent AF, it becomes less clear. And if you take a look from, from like 20 years ago up till now, many different approaches have been developed. We have had ablation of complex signals, we create additional lesions, we create mitral line lines, cave tricuspid is line e lesions, large lesions in the right atrium. But none of those approaches so far increased the outcome. Um, so, yeah, we are trying, and, and every, every month a new approach comes up in literature, and we try that again, so we're struggling with it. Um, so, I think it's still, because you still, you don't, we don't know in front which patient is going to benefit from, from pulmonary vein isolation. So, it, it still remains a little bit trial or error. Uh, sometimes you see patients with long-standing persistent AF, you do an ablation procedure, and then you have to cardiovert the patient, the patient goes home, and surprisingly, he's like six months without AF. And then the patient is very happy. Wow. So, yeah, <laughs> you need to... Uh, it, we cannot give a clear answer yet because we need to learn which patient still benefits for a, pulmonary, for a pulmonary vein isolation or even additional approaches. So that's an ongoing process. I have another question also coming. So that question says, if you have, what is easier to ablate when LV's LA size has increased or when LA function has deteriorated or can you not discriminate it so easily? No, I think the, the latter is the case. Uh, interestingly, um, because of the time I left it out, I had a slide of a patient with an Epstein, an amorbus Epstein, where he had a huge atrium. There was no doubt that that was a dilated atrium. And when you take a look at the patterns of activation, it was so smooth conduction, no conduction abnormalities at all. So the patient, suppose it was the left atrium, and we would have said, oh no, we're not going to ablate it. Well, actually, the conduction was beautiful, and you could have been very successful with your pulmonary vein isolation. So the relation between dilatation uh, and, and conduction abnormalities in AF is also not quite understood. But if function goes down? If function goes down, um, yeah, you also have remodeling of your ventricles, and that is recently discovered that there is also electropathology in your ventricles. I would definitely go for an ablation, because that means that yeah, it can only go worse. Thank you so much. First, a great lecture, and you give us a lot of information to think about. But what is clear to me is that we have to think about early treatment. Yes, early it's most detection yeah, and, and early, early treatment. treatment. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>